Hello everyone. Today I want to present a little project I did with a few of my colleagues uh, about visual programming or low-code programming if you prefer. So something very similar to Dynamo for Revit but this time written in JavaScript for the web. On the integration we did for, for Forge uh, is very simple. So you could do a Forge application or proof of concept very easily uh, just by dragging nodes into a canvas. So all the green nodes here are really just for debug. Uh, so imagine only the, the other nodes being your application. So in, in this screenshot I did here is uh, just a way to pass your BIM360 urban project uh, folder structure and output the result. Um, so I'll be demoing that at the end of this presentation. Uh, but first thing first, uh, Node-RED. So Node-RED is a visual programming environment written by IBM for the IoT platform originally. It's fully open source. Um, so we're going to, to show you how to install it on your computer. Um, maybe later I'll show how you could deploy it on a server. Uh, but what is interesting is not only you can do programming with nodes, but you can also create uh, a web app with UI. Uh, again, there is a sample I've written uh, which follows the Learning Forge uh, tutorial um, that you can deploy um, on, on this Node-RED. Um, so Node-RED is open source, so you can find um, the source code on GitHub and you have all the instructions on how to, to deploy it, but I'm, I'm going to do it with you uh, right now. The GitHub uh, link here. And now if I move to my command line, so I'm, I'm in my documents not write folder. Um, there is already a folder there, which is Cyril, but if I go in Cyril right now, it's empty. Um, so this folder would be used later for storing my not read settings. Uh, so I'll show you how you could specify which profile you want to use when, when using Node-RED. So here I'm going to clone the repo. If you don't have Git installed on your machine, you can still download the zip files that would uh, be uh, exactly the same thing. Um, but in case you want to contribute to the Node-RED community, it's a good idea. Um, to use Git instead. So let's give it a couple of more seconds to finish. Should not be long. Okay, now it's there. So now if I do a list on my folder, I have another directory which is called not read. The first thing I'm doing now is to do npm install because this is a Node.js application. So this time it will take a while. So in the video, I'll probably cut if it's taking too long. But in the meantime, I can say a couple of things. The first one is GitHub repo here is the Forge Node Red implementation. Um, and there are a couple of ways to, to install the Forge Node Red uh, nodes into into Node-RED. So if you're a developer, uh, you could install this repo on your machine and then do an npm install um, directory on the folder. Uh, that would be one way. So this would be just in case you want to, to make some code change into the Forge implementation. The standard way to install external nodes is to use the palette option into Node-RED. So, which is what we're going to do. Uh, if you search for other nodes, you, you should go to the uh, Node-RED org uh, website where you can find all published Node-RED information. So a couple of words about the um, Forge Node-RED nodes being implemented. So you have one node per API. So you would find the data management DM, uh, the data management OSS, um, which is buckets on object, the commands, model derivative, design automation. 
on for sure the two on the top are uh, OAuth implementation. So they're not called OAuth because uh, they do implement OAuth, but it's really about managing your Forge API key as well as your Forge access tokens. That's why I call them credentials. So the first one, it's in gray, meaning that it will never be exported. So it's a safe way of storing into a flow. We do export them. The keys are not exported. Um, they would stay on the machine in the profile section um, with encryption, um, but they would never be exported. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but because they're not exported, and to avoid you to re-enter these credentials every time, I have implemented a Forge default credential, um, which is a, a node without any connections, which will implement a default access to your access token within a flow or globally within a node red instance. Again, it's secure. It's just a way to avoid to have to change each of the nodes configuration. Um, but I, I'll come back to that when, when we go closer to, to demos. Okay, so now uh, NPM install is done. So I just need to do now um, another step, which is the uh, run build. NPM run build. which won't take a lot of time this time. Okay, so now our node red instance is ready to run. Um, one thing I've done um, is I have set up already my Forge client ID, my Forge callback. So you see that's my client ID. I won't show you my secret. A secret is a secret. Um, my forge callback. So this is when I want to use um, three-legged. I need to have a callback. And uh, I've defined port 3000. By default, not red right, use 1880, uh, but you can control that by changing uh, the port number. Um, and I have also the forge client secret. And so build is done. So now if I just want to run node red, and you see I'm still in my node red folder, so to add serial is still empty. Um, but now if I run this, so here, what I'm doing is I set the node of variable to development. I could do production when I go live. I start the node engine and I execute um, the node red application. And this is where I, prof I say, where is my profile? So the user folder being, um, yeah. I just do one thing. So I move to uh, this folder, and then now I can do this. So now serial is one folder below. Um, that would be my user profile. When I do this, node right starts. And what I can do now is I can go to localhost 3000. And I have my first uh, node red canvas started with all the default nodes which come with node red. Um, so let's do a very simple thing. Uh, I drag and drop two nodes. I'm going to connect them. And if I say deploy, now I can say, let me move to the debug 
here. When I press, this node generates a timestamp into the payload property of the message transiting to this one. And this one is uh, a debug node, which is just outputting the result. So here I can see that uh, timestamp being displayed, but I can change that to be like more JSON. Um, and I can now say something like test one, uh, demo, hello everyone. So I'm defining a, a simple JSON file and I say done, I say done. And this time on this one, instead of displaying the payload only, I'm going to display the complete message. And I redeploy. And this time, if I inject, what happens now is I still have the payload and the payload contains my JSON, but I also have all the information coming out uh, because before I was showing only the payload, but now I'm showing the complete message. So let's remove that. So now that we clean up our canvas, so let me show you how you now import the forge node into, um, into node red. So to do that, you go to the manage palette. And here you have um, the default uh, nodes which have been already imported. So we have this node red sentiment. Remember it was, it was here at the bottom, right there. Um, but now you can also search for, for your own. So here, and then you say node red node forge, and you can find this node right there. So you could say install. You could look for information, but let's press install um, immediately. So now what happens is not red download the uh, Forge implementation. So it tells you that all the nodes which have been imported, um, and they now installed into um, your instance. Um, and you can always watch for the one you want to remove, um, disable temporarily. It, it re you have full control on what, what you're doing here. So now that we have our nodes, there is a section being added there. Um, it's about to put the order. Uh, I'll show you how to do that uh, because if you work a lot with Forge, it's better that it's at the at the top of the palette. But you can always use uh, this little edit box search here to isolate nodes um, very quickly. So you could say Forge if you if you want to do that. Okay, so now there are a couple of examples uh, being um, also imported. So if you say import, and you go to examples, you would find a section here where you can find uh, all the information, um, all the examples which has been provided with this implementation. So people are usually terrified doing three-legged. Um, so I'm going to, to use this uh, three-legged example uh, at first. And now we have a three-legged um, canvas, which has been added to, um, to my instance. Uh, everything is already implemented for managing three-legged and getting your 
that I'm a user profile uh, after you log in. Um, on you notice here I have two forged credentials. I have three-legged and two-legged. So the reason is that later I'm going to use two-legged implementation as well. Um, so the reason is that I could have two on two on three-legged credentials in parallel. And because data management, for example, use could use two-legged as well. Um, that's why I have these two nodes. But they're not yet configured. You see, there is this uh, red row here, which means that the node is not yet configured. So let's see why. When you come here, it says, oh, there's no forged credential um, on the system. So you need to create one. So you could say, okay, add new forge credentials. Um, we went to it's f three legged. Um, and you see here, there is environment variable, forge client ID, forge client secret. Now I need to select which are the scope I want to use. So I'm going to remove these two. And I'm going to keep everything else, even though um, bucket, well, maybe I can just remove them. So bucket create, bucket, bucket, because it doesn't really make sense um, to have the bucket scope in here. Um, because we use related, I also have the callback URL. Um, I can provide um, a state as well if I wanted to. Um, or if I didn't set up my own variables, I could have provided my access token if I wanted to. Anyway, now I have credentials for three-legged on that my fourth credentials three-legged node. So it is now set up. You see the red triangle disappeared. Uh, my Forge two-legged. I won't use the dev three-legged because uh, the token um, has something very different. So I create another two-legged uh, credential. So this time, let's say you could two-legged. So use the same client ID on secret. Uh, this time, I'm going to only use bucket data code all. I can't access any of the three-legged scope, um, so I won't use that. On here, I need to remove or to make this callback blank because if I leave it, the implementation of this node will get that it's a three-legged um, definition. So by removing the callback, I'm just telling the system, this is a two-legged. And I could provide a, a state if I wanted, but that's not useful in the two-legged environment. Uh, again, I can provide a two-legged access token instead of the variables. Uh, if I wanted to. So now we good. And the red triangles disappear as well. So which means that now on this flow, um, I have access to implementation. So let's clean the debug window on deploy. You can ignore any of these. Um, I still need to uh, to make some code fix um, to do that, but you can just ignore for the time being. Now we set up our two credential nodes, so three-legged and two-legged. Um, the three-legged workflow is to first authorize the application by entering your login and password. Uh, to do this, uh, we need to author 
a URL where you, you're going to start uh, your browser onto the uh, Autodesk identity server. And on once you have logged in, uh, the system will call back your application um, so you can get the, the token. So the callback is this node. And the system will call back directly this node and then we'll, uh, we will get an authorization code um, passed to the URL where we can exchange with a token. And once we have an ac a valid access token, then we can ask for the user profile. Um, once you have a three-legged token, you also have what is called a refresh token. Uh, a refresh token is to avoid to have to enter your login password each time. So you can use this additional token to get a new valid token. Um, so in this case, we can either press this button here to force uh, the new token to be generated, but we also have this node which will always fire every 30 minutes um, to force the token generation. But I want you to notice that whenever Node-RED starts or the flow is starting, after two seconds, it will be injected. That's important to notice for later uh, because you, you will notice that when we will uh, reload uh, the application or deploy a new flow, uh, we'll have this refresh process being started automatically. Uh, so first, we press this button, which start our Chrome browser. On here, I'm going to be asked for my login, which I'm going to do. So I'm resizing the window so you can see what happens. So we have already executed all um, the top nodes. So this one, the authorized one. And because I'm on, on a Mac, I have this Node OS 6, which has been executed. Um, this one failed because I'm not on Windows. Uh, that's why you have this error uh, flag uh, below the node, but it's it's really not important. If you run on Windows, um, you'll get it on the OS X one. So I'm going to enter my login, my password. And what I want you to notice is you'll see that the get token will be called on the data management me will be called as well. Um, you will notice that because just below the node in this area, you'll see messages uh, being displayed. So as soon as I press sign in, it will go to the callback, it will go to get tokens and the um, DM me. Okay, get token me. You see it was very fast. And now uh, this window says that I'm signing, I can close this window. It comes from this HTML template here, uh, which was automatically returned to your browser. So just to show you, um, that is just an HTML page where it has a message um, which has been di displayed. Uh, what is important is this get authorized node generate this message, uh, which was sent to the OS 6 on Windows node. Um, on here, it's just the URL um, that is sent to the Autodesk server. When the callback came, we exchange for a token and we call the data management uh, me API, which we isolate the user ID and we display this one. So in that case, this is my oxygen user ID, um, which are going to be used later, for example, for um, the data management X user ID. Uh, this is bringing um, the user ID into an X user ID global variable. Um, you need to not to know that whenever you store uh, in either into the global or into the flow or um, or message a variable or a property, um, they are just memory only. So if you restart um, the Node-RISE instance or if you deploy the node, uh, everything will be lost. If you want to keep them, uh, 
Um, so when you, whatever happens is still available to you. You need to do some setting change uh, to make that permanent. Um, I, I'm going to show you how, how we do it. Someone may ask, yeah, but look at this. Your, all your blue nodes, they have these red triangles. And I say, when you see something with red, it means that it's not initialized. Um, so the reason these nodes are not initialized, but they're still working, is because as I explained, these two nodes here are default nodes uh, for credentials. So this one not being initialized for the credentials, by default, start looking for uh, a node being the default one. Um, this is to save time when every window Close. We don't have to go on initialize each of the node. You can just say you can just say that you want to use one of the default. If you prefer, you can still go in each node. Like for example, let me do this and say, okay, now I want you to work with a three-legged. Okay, so in that case, now you make reference not to the node here, which is the default credential node, but to the actual definition of the OAuth related implementation. So let's remove that. We don't need it. Um, <clears throat> now, what is in, uh, the other thing I can mention is if I press this button, I will renew uh, the access token, so it will go to the refresh on data management. Um, if I press, you see refresh on the data management. Um, I still see my user ID being there. So now um, I said you need access token on refresh on being stored permanently. So to do that, um, we are going to go into the user settings. So remember, I had this user profile, um, which was empty at the beginning. Now it has been populated with a lot of files, but the one I want you to look into is this one, the settings GS file, which I've already modified um, doing two things. The first one, remember I said, if you want the palette to be displayed first, you create a, a palette category array, and you can name all the palettes or only the, the one you want to be at, on the top. So for example, here I've put four, that's why it's now at the top. Um, but if I want the output being second, I can just say output second, and then will come commands, subflows, and etc. Okay, so you, you describe the, let's say, the one you, you want um, on top. You don't need to go through all of them. You can, but you don't. For the storage, you can create context storage. Um, for Forge, um, you need to use the credentials storage where you say you want everything to be stored on the local file system. Um, and then you leave the default to be memory only. Uh, the Forge node has been set up to use the credentials context storage. Um, so you can choose a local file system or database or whatever. Uh, because I'm using file storage, I also made another change here, which is I have a credential secret for encryption. So here I put a secret key and that's my Forge client ID, uh, but it could be anything you want. Once you have this change into your settings file, uh, you can then restart your um, node instance um, and all the change will be taken into account. Okay, so now let's look into a different example. Um, so the, I, I still go to import, I go to my examples, I go to the uh, not red. And here I have an example which, which will go on list the folder structure 
of one of your herb project. What we're doing into this flow is we first go on find the herb, then find the project we want, then we'll go into the root folders uh, to grab all of them, and we iterate these root folders to find all the sub subfolders. And once we have all the subfolders, if we have finished going into the structure, uh, then we we just display the result or we again. So let's take a look at how it's done on um, how it's working. So again, red triangles means these nodes were not properly set up uh, for the credentials, but we use the default credentials we have on the three-legged tab. Um, but what is important here is, you see here I have, it's a list hub operation and I have a filter. So if I don't put a filter, I will get everything back. Um, but if I put a filter, I can say, I want to filter by name, by region, by version, whatsoever. So here I'm listening, I'm filtering by name and I'm looking for this particular hub. Notice here the user ID, that's the X user ID property I could use if I want to. Uh, I'm not using it here because I'm using full three-legged um, implementation, but uh, I could use the two-legged implementation if I want to. So now when this one execute, I go to this node, which will isolate the hub ID. Uh, so the way it's done is that I put into the message hub ID, which is the uh, list hub node, and I isolate this ID only. Now this hub ID is passed to the list object uh, again list of uh, project. This time, it's a bit stupid, but it's uh, just for demoing, you can list by almost anything. I'm filtering by the ID, which is usually what I want to find. So here I know the ID because I already run uh, the list project before and I capture the ID and now I'm filtering by the ID. Um, but exactly the same as before, um, nothing changed. And then what I'm doing here is I'm setting up the project ID into the message, which will be passed later to all the nodes. I won't explain right away these three function nodes. Um, I want to go first through the rest of the um, flow uh, and I'll come back to those. So, but in this first one, what I'm doing is I'm preparing data for the iteration. And here I have um, an array iteration um, node, which will take control of making sure that I'm going to execute each of the root folders um, nodes. In this one, I'm just setting up the folder ID, um, which will be given, given to me by the uh, message array node um, on that, the message array node gives me an index. So I just go and pass into my, into the array I've given before. And then I call the folder content. I will combine all the responses, first level responses into the join node. Then I will do some cleanup on reordering. And if I'm done, then I display the result after some cleanup. If I still have folders to proceed, then I loop again to my message array. So let's see how these first and third node are implemented. Um, let me remove anything which is in comment. It's not useful. So first I'm creating an array where I'll store all the folder ID I need to process. The reference object is just a, a fast index of all the folders. So whenever I get a response, I get the ID, I can just go and uh, access the reference object of the folder definition and I can push content into it. 
um, just because in JavaScript, every object is, is a reference. Then I go to my payload data. If there is any top folders to process, then I get its definition, I get its name. Uh, here, I just get either the name or the display name. Um, you choose what you want to do. When I store into the result, um, the information about this node. It's always a folder, but um, what I do here is I'm pushing the ID into my array. So I'm just telling my flow implementation that that's one of the folder I want to process. Uh, in the result, I had a content because I want to store the subfolders. And for the reference, fast reference, index and I store my object at the folder ID, which is then passed to this array, which go into, etc. The joined node will return me an array of all the results. So now I need to read the information from uh, this array. And again, I can remove anything which is in the comment. The first thing I do is I reinitialize the array because it means the previous node or iteration has processed all the IDs, so I'm just resetting the array. And then I go through each payload. Um, each payload contains some da uh, data management information, um, so I process all of them. The code structure is very similar to the one before, so I get the name, I get the ID, I put uh, information where it should go. The message reference, fast index, you see, that's the way I can retrieve the object and put things immediately into it. Uh, and then you see it's, it's very similar. What is important on this node is this piece. If I don't have anything else to process, I'm deleting the message array variable because the next node in the flow, which is this one, is that I'm testing if array is present or not. If it's present, there's something in it, and I need to loop. If not, then I'm done. So let me deploy this flow, but while I'm going to deploy, I want you to watch out what will happen here. Um, you remember I said whenever we restart node or whenever we deploy, um, this node will kick off um, a process. So I'm pressing deploy. After two seconds, we have refresh. We get the me profile and we got the debug message. Okay. So now if I go here, um, the only node which will display something is uh, the uh, green node at the bottom. Um, how things are working. So remember here, 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 you'll see some message, which is a visual way of seeing what happens uh, during the, uh, the execution. So let me press this button. List hubs, list projects, list folders, and we loop. And we have tons of folder contents being called into a loop. And when we have processed everything, and it can take a while depending on the size of your um, project. You have this exit loop um, and then it goes to this message, which is right there. So again, uh, look at this node here. Um, when I go over this message, you see that the green node is surrounded by dash red lines, which means that this message comes from this node. Okay, so let's look at the results. So 
everything is here. So we have the project files, we have plans, we have shop drawings, um, which is has no subfolders. But if we go to plans, it has Pacific, Japan, Revit, whatever. So you see we have the data structure with all the folder ID also what sample is doing. 